So 10 minutes on acute thoracic aortic syndrome. Uh, another area that um, I think it's worth talking about, something the matter should be proud of uh, between ourselves and radiology, the chiropractic team, the vascular team, I think we have a certain ownership of this area. We've seen an awful lot of cases from uh, national referrals to, to local referrals and so on. So what I'll do, again, time is limited. Uh, I'll just spend about uh, 10 minutes and briefly give you a steeplechase through this, uh, particularly directed towards the junior staff, because some of this area is a little enigmatic if you're not really used to it, perhaps. But basically, uh, acute aortic syndromes, uh, for me, uh, embrace the, the spectrum from penetrating ulcers intramural hematomas, dissections, and uh, transections, as well as the odd case of aortitis. And ultimately, what it's all about is rupturing an uncommonly some form of fistula or connection into an adjacent organ. Um, superimposed on that, but somewhat connected, is the whole area of aneurysms and pseudoaneurysms, thrombus and blockages and stuff. But they tend to be more in the chronic state, and they're not really part of an acute aortic syndrome. And I won't talk about those today in the interest of time. Penetrating ulcer, um, they can occur anywhere. Where there's an artery. Um, we see them in the carotids, we see them in the legs, we see them everywhere, but they can lead to this kind of entity in the thoracic aorta where there's a breach in the uh, integrity of the aortic wall. Uh, it gets contained by the body's attempt to heal, but you ultimately end up with a large aneurysm. And they can be relatively minor, and they can be in, of little consequence, but they can go on to this kind of scenario, which is one which is off the medial side of the aorta and actually ruptured into the mediastinum giving this very large um, hemomediastinum and hemothorax so this patient died of that ultimately. They tend to be current patients with just very, very ugly vessels who have really advanced atherosclerosis. They tend to be a field defect, the whole vessel is affected and if you find one you'll find others uh, as well. The next sort of stage of the process, uh, if you imagine it a continuum, but it's not actually a continuum, all of these can occur in isolation as well, is an intramural hematoma which some people believe is, is a rupture of the so-called vasa visorum or the vessels within the wall of the aorta, uh, but they can actually occur also, as this illustration suggests, as a, as a breach uh, or a penetrating ulcer that then uh, bleeds instead of bleeding out beyond the almond tissue, actually just keeps bleeding within the wall of the aorta. It can be a so-called disappearing disease. Um, um, I am someone who believes in this, but I'm actually uh, uh, probably a minority, but I've seen enough cases over my uh, years doing this to, to start to understand the, 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 the natural history. There's a patient who in 2012 presented with this, what is essentially a type A insult or something affecting the ascending aorta here and the arch and for various complicated reasons we did nothing and it went away by the following January and he went back to a totally normal aorta, raising the possibility that this could be managed conservatively in select cases. But they don't all do that. Uh, here's one that came in, uh, again, very similar picture really. Uh, it was a kind of an intramural hematoma that went on to uh, a dissection as well, and that was the patient in April. And then within, uh, you can see the ascending aorta was pristine, and you can see the dissection distally. Uh, and then um, 24 hours later, it has propagated into the ascending aorta. Uh, and this one, um, uh, we stented because we felt that it was propagating. Uh, and as we, after we stented, the hematoma that was in the ascending aorta actually went away. Um, Intramural hematomas versus thrombosed false lumens versus penetrating ulcers and fat and so on can be very complex. Uh, there's a certain sixth sense about these. There's a lot of imaging features which I won't go through in the interest of time, but you can differentiate these, but uh, sometimes it's rather than the actual imaging, taking the whole thing together and then taking a number of the imaging features and making features and making the best guess. A lot of people get hung up particularly outside of uh, Echo Street in terms of is this a type A um, insult, a thrombose, false lumen, or intramural hematoma? It can be very, very difficult. No, and we've had a few cases where we've had the courage to treat them conservatively, but only because we've had multidisciplinary teams involved um, and we've shared the load of the responsibility. But bottom line is if you're agonizing over it, treat it as a type A because you can't afford to miss a type A. And if you're not sure and you don't have someone who can say it with confidence as an intramural hematoma, you shouldn't really take a chance. Dissection then is, as many of you will, well know is rather like tearing the wallpaper off the uh, the sitting room wall and the and damper fluid getting in behind that and, and, and peeling away the internal flaps at the end up with a true and a false lumen. This is a case that came in incidentally. The patient actually was getting a screening uh, MRI because it was a family history of Holcomb. So we were actually looking for Holcomb. 
But in fact, what you can appreciate here is a bicuspid aortic valve and a type A asymptomatic um, um, uh, dissection, although it's not quite asymptomatic in that when I met with the patient and his wife to explain to them that they weren't going home today uh, after their outpatient elective screening MRI, that in fact they were probably going to the theatre, and he said he had some symptoms, and then the wife proceeded to kill him in front of me because he didn't say it to her, and there was a kind of whole drama there, but uh, it was type A, and you can see the flap is right down to the osteum of the right coronary, and it also, also was into the osteum of the left main, which you can see here on the CT angiogram. Um, you don't need to do angiography of these patients anymore, you just do the CT and you can clearly see this is going to do something very bad. Uh, and they do things bad sometimes, they can rupture, they can occlude the coronary, they can give hemopericardium and any of those uh, will lead to death very, very quickly. So type A is largely a surgical emergency um, and has to be treated right now and there isn't really room to, to sit on them. Um, type B's we like to think of as kind of medical management, reasonably conservative and they all go away. Uh, they don't necessarily, this poor man came with chest pain when the, para, when the GP saw him, he gave him aspirin, when the paramedics came to pick him up from his, uh, he had, he, they gave him aspirin as well. And when he came to our ID, we also gave him aspirin. So he had something like 1,200 milligrams of aspirin uh, by the time he got here. And guess what? He actually bled uh, out into his chest, uh, which is this hemothorax here. And uh, we stented him and thankfully he did okay. Um, this chap is just a good example of a very unusual type B. This is an isolated type B dissection which bled into the right hemithorax, which I've never seen before or since, but he actually got a hemothorax on the right side and he had chest pain um, at 1400 hours, you can see there in Bowman, at 1600 hours he had ruptured um, and uh, we stented him as well. Uh, there's the stent going in and he survived. Um, this is another one, just uh, one again, you watch them sometimes, you just have to get involved and as a radiologist and team, you just have to stay very involved, keep an eye on the pain every day, see what's going on, don't be afraid to re-image, these are older patients, radiation dose isn't a big issue. This guy behaved reasonably well, we were managing him conservatively, but between November the 18th and the 21st, he developed a hemothorax, so it was time to do something, and we did, and we stented him, and he did fine. Um, imaging, you all will know that, or probably know that dissection isn't really so much about the dissection, often they die, and mostly they die actually of end organ insult. They die of killing their kidneys, killing their bowel, and killing their legs. Uh, the actual dissection, although I've shown cases of rupture, isn't really the common uh, scenario. What we do when we treat them endovascularly, it's really about limiting the dissection in the first instance. That's what the stenting is all about, closing off the holes of the dissection, ideally trying to <coughs> shut down the dissection. It doesn't get rid of it, but it try stops it propagating further. And then the second thing we do is we sometimes fenestrate them, which is basically connecting the true and false lumen to restore the blood flow to the end organ. We did one of those last week here, for example. Um, and that's really our goal, uh, primarily. Transection is something Matter has done more than anybody else. Um, I started this service in about 2000 and, not now, but uh, it's about 10 years now, nine years we've been doing this, and um, it's become something that's an absolute no-brainer. Uh, these are patients who come in, usually polytraumas, usually boy racers after uh, too many beers and decelerating injuries. They get spinal injuries, of course, they get lots of other injuries and they get uh, tears of their aorta at the places where it's relatively immobile. And you can see here, I don't know how well you can appreciate it, but there's a step off in the aortic arch here and there's an intramural hematoma here. You get them to theater, ideally you, you, you uh, get a stent in, and that is the end of the problem. And uh, as I say, they do very well, but they are unstable. These are the patients who used, who used to die at the scene of the accident. Paramedics, etc., have changed to the degree they're getting to hospital quicker, they're surviving. But they're still dying, you know, they, we've had one die at intubation, we've had one die at the moment you put in the stent, because the whole thing can just fall apart at any moment. It's really just being held together by sellotape in the mediastinum and nothing much more. Uh, one thing we get consulted a lot about is a ductus uh, variant, which is a, um, a common misinterpretation at outside hospitals, uh, where there's a little persistent ductus arteriosus, which can look like a, uh, an injury, and it's really just, again, a kind of an experience thing. They come with other injuries too, as I said, this is a guy who's ruptured his diaphragm. You can see the diaphragm here, and you can see the diaphragm here, and you can see a gap in the middle that's full of colon. And you can see the colon moving up into the mediastinum. And so this guy also had to have a diaphragmatic uh, repair afterwards. Uh, coming into the home stretch here, just talk about aortitis. This is an unusual condition, although again, just uh, I'm a minority here, but I think there's a lot more of this than we realize, but it's uh, having a threshold for, for considering it. 
And if you consider it, you see more of it than you might think. Um, here's a case who presented with chest pain and a raised CRP. Nobody could find any causes. Ultimately, because they were concerned about cancer, they sent him for a PET scan. And it's a nice example of giant cell arteritis affecting the, the aorta. You can just see that it's red hot, literally, uh, because of aortitis throughout the, the blood vessel. And uh, the scans, the CTs on these are somewhat um, subtle, I would suggest. But, uh, but if you have a PET, um, you, you can certainly make the call. The other thing that we see, because we do a lot of other valve work and everything, is valve infection and valve dehiscence, and this is what I call the so-called sh shower cap sign. Here's the, the, the prosthetic valve here, and around it is um, um, contrast that is working its way out along the suture line. So the, camp, this, the valve in this case is actually free-floating at this point, and it's about to dehisce. So this guy went for back for two subsequent surgeries, but he ultimately died of this. It's a very high mortality once it takes off and they don't do very well. If they get over the acute inflammation, whether, whatever the cause may be, they can survive and do all right, but they ultimately may come back. And this is a patient who had aortitis, and then about 20 years down the, lone, the road, developed a huge lump of mural thrombus, which is just perfectly poised to go up into the carotids and other great vessels. Again, we agonized over this for a while, but ultimately John Hurley took him to theater, and you can see he cleaned it out. There's the post-operative imaging. And it was just basically aortitis or infl old inflammatory chain with a big lump of um, clot of varying ages because the clot just was begetting more clot. Um, I'll just finish on, on, um, on aneurysms and pseudoagonists. They're not really, again, part of the acute aortic syndrome generally. Most ruptures are, you know, die. Um, they don't, we don't get to acute rupture in thoracic aortas like the, uh, the uh, vascular surgeons do with the, um, with the uh, abdominal aneurysms, the, the uh, mediastinum, because of the, the in the descending in particular uh, connection with the free space of the pleura, the hematoma just isn't contained. With the abdominal aortic aneurysms, to a degree it's contained in the retroperitoneum to give you a tincture of time to do something about it, but generally when they start bleeding upstairs, uh, nothing can hold it back really, and it doesn't hold back. This is just an interesting one, a patient who had a, had a patch um, done for a coarctation um, about 30 years ago, and then you can see they're developing a pseudoaneurysm here uh, later, 30 years later, but this became symptomatic uh, and we ultimately stented that. Uh, here's an unusual case. I think we presented at Grand Rounds before. It's a patient again who had a patch repair of a coarctation here by Morris, I think, and uh, did very well. But then ultimately the graft broke down, but this became an acute aortic syndrome because they got hemoptysis because the actual breakdown is bleeding into the lungs. This is all heme, heme in the lung parenchyma. And um, it's a very complicated case in many respects, but this is the native coarctation. This is the bypass that was done for the coarctation. And it's up here that's actually bleeding into the lung. Lots of, lots of reasons not to operate on this poor patient. So what we did was we actually just, we stented the coarctation, which has sort of become the modern way of treating coarctation. So we basically treated the coarctation and then decided to abandon this um, graft. Um, and uh, so the way we did that was uh, we, uh, probably better if I illustrate it here for you, we put a stent into the coarctation, and then I put up a thoracic stent to cover the opening of the old surgical graft. <coughs> so that basically occluded it, although it still had blood flow from the left subclavian, so I put a plug into the left subclavian, and so the whole thing was, was, uh, was excluded. Uh, and that patient has done well. We did that about, I think it's uh, three years ago now. Uh, I don't know how many of you have heard this when you've gone home, um, but uh, just a few tips for the students about when to be afraid or be very afraid. That's this particular quote, if you've heard of this, from this movie in the 1950s. Um, the, thing for the, the teaching points for the trainees would be any sort of refractory pain, obviously heading into the back, into the middle of the back, any new serosal fluid, i.e. pleural fluid or pericardial fluid, um, any temporal change, anything happening very fast, any change at all in CT is a concern, it suggests instability, anything proximal to the left subclavian is a worry, anything that's on a background of aneurysm or any other va vasculopathy, older age, high blood pressure, antiplatelet agents, anticoagulant agents and family histories, all of those are predictors of people who do worse. Um, and when the imaging is unclear, be afraid as well, because if you can't confidently say it's nothing, uh, it's, you must always consider it a, a dissection and an aneurysm, et cetera, until otherwise proven. So um, 
these were the learning objectives, just really to cover the spectrum of the acute thoracic aortic syndrome. A couple of acknowledgements of, the, of the, the gaps that we have. We still don't really understand most of these. We don't understand why they occur. We certainly don't know their natural histories. We don't understand the flow patterns of dissections. The There's an awful lot we don't know. We haven't been able to model this disease very well. Uh, we don't know what causes a lot of it. We don't really know what the optimal therapies are. And although the stents is a very nice, um, shall we say, elegant move onwards from the difficult and protracted, sometimes bypass and open surgeries, I would be the first to acknowledge it's sort of crude. It's a bit one size fits all. And I'm not sure what's going to happen to those graphs in 30 years. And there's an awful lot of hidden vasculopathy. There's a lot of cystic medial necrosis. There's a lot of hidden uh, other syndromes that don't have phenotypic expression like Marfan's, Neal, or Stanlos. There's a lot of other ones. And uh, um, uh, Hal Dietz, who, in, who discovered Marfan's, has discovered about 16 other genetic variants on this. Um, and we see a lot of it on the street because Mark Redmond has a Marfan clinic. So we see some of it through there. What's new in the matter in the last 12 months is we've done the first frozen elephant trunk in Ireland, uh, which is a complicated thing, but it's basically a combination of a stent graft with an open surgical graft, whereby one can do treat the, the uh, entire ascending and descending aorta through a sternotomy. And we did our second one um, two weeks ago, so we've done two of those now. The scalloped graft is basically a fenestrated graft, or a graft that can now start treating the arch and by putting um, stents down through the carotids. And that's coming, I, I don't think it's ready for prime time yet, but it's very close and there's a couple of sites that have started that. And at UCD, um, there's a lot of 3D happening, 3D printing. Um, and uh, one of our registrars, Michael O'Reilly, uh, kind of gave me this picture. This is a, an image of a heart from a CAT scan. And um, we don't have the greatest, latest, greatest uh, 3D printer that is available. The most, uh, the best ones are in uh, Germany, and they're made they use silicone, and they can really give you a very true representation of what you can see. Uh, but even still, I think you'd agree, uh, this is pretty, pretty, pretty good. This is so. This is just the CT scan, uh, uh, and the data that's in it plugged into um, a 3D printer. And um, as a radiologist, I don't find this as helpful uh, because I'm so used to looking at 3D imaging from this from the CAT scanner. But certainly from surgeons and others that we've talked to and showed these pictures to, in terms of planning surgical things, it clearly has potential. Um, it clearly has potential in customizing prostheses of various types, whether it be for AAAs or for hips, etc. Um, and uh, it's handy for families to fully grasp what exactly you're trying to do, what you're trying to treat. So this this is really the next big thing. Uh, I don't. I would say within a decade we should probably we should have a 3D printer on the Matter campus, and we should have our surgeons of various colours and creeds being able to send their cases down there and get a print out uh, and so forth. And I don't think that's fanciful. I think that's very real, and uh, it's kind of natural thinker, natural sort of process in my opinion. But it's another flag for UCD because to be fair, they've moved this process along quite a bit. Uh, that's it. <coughs> Thank you for your time. A lot of this is quite urgent, particularly on the right side. So, how, how does that work? How does that work? Uh, and for the numbers of the last. Well, we've done about 45 thoracic stents in the acute setting over um, a decade. We do anything on an average sort of four to six to eight a year. It's famine or feast. It's completely unpredictable. A lot of it's related to motor vehicle accidents and things. So, it's a little bit hard to put any shape on it. It's very difficult organizing a service around it. Sure. Uh, for the other cases, we run an MDM now. We've tried to keep it at one a month, but it's growing to about two a month. At each MDM, there are approximately 20 cases of thoracic disease, of which approximately no more than maybe 15% or what I would consider 15-20%, uh, one-fifth are in the acute aortic syndrome. The rest are all largely aneurysm you know, management one way or another. Do you do the hybrid? Yeah. Ideally, uh, as you know, there are staffing issues, as um, Karen alluded to, in terms of getting radiography out of ours, getting nursing out of ours to work up there, cross skilling. So we certainly try to, um, if, uh, but um, we have had to do uh, them in the uh, radiology uh, unit for for that reason uh, on occasion, because we can at least get a radiographer down there and so forth. Um, so the hybrid theatre. 
you'd love to say that they, they really should be all done there. That's the, that's the obvious answer because for anesthesia and for general support and if you want to convert to bypass and so forth, it's, it's obviously the place to do it. But we can't assure ourselves again in terms of service continuity that we can get in there out of ours. And does the imaging potentially make a big difference in how we view it? Is it better equipment? It's, no, it's the same. But I think the sterility is better. The, uh, the whole OR setup, theater setup is better. Um, and again, if you're going to be truly multidisciplinary, I think certainly the surgeons and the anaesthetists are more happy up there. They're slightly unhappy in, in our hostile environment. Mark? I just wanted to follow up on your very last point, uh, Leo. You might be interested to know that we have actually got a grant for the 3D printing uh, for Aortis. Oh, very it's, good. it's about to start the, the work on it. We have to get ethics committee approval from here to look at not just making models, but actually making an actual simulator where you can practice branch grafts and stuff like that before, on patient-specific branch grafts before you actually start. And so this is with UCD or this is just so a matter of This thing. is with UCD. Oh, very good. This is with computer science department in UCD. Yeah, no, I think these are all great innovations. I, I mean, it, to me, it's the most exciting thing that's happening. The stents and everything is all a bit old, frankly, now. There's nothing particularly that novel about it. It's largely lateral translating and some small iterative steps. But I haven't seen a paradigm shift, and I don't see another one coming for a while. But the printing, to me, is fascinating for, for surgery, for hepatectomies. Jerry, you could take, you could actually get a 3D model of a liver and actually look at it. If you go down Canty's line, what will you be left with? You can actually physically hold it and so forth. So I think it's the most exciting thing that's going to happen next. And if Matra could grasp that space with the help of UCD and um, the professor here, obviously, and, his, and the education center and all of that, I think we could really do something very, very fun and different and leading edge um, stuff. Uh, which, which would be great. So why 10, 10 years? Well, if you're going to do it right, I mean, you know how Ireland works, but I mean, to get the kind of monies and to get the physical plant, and I think we should do it right. I think we should get a proper 3D printer, not not a crude one. We should get the really best that the money can buy, because I think we're going to use them for patient care. We can't be having these steppy images that look kind of nice, but they're, and patients like them, but you and I know they're a bit crude. I think we need to go to the next phase. But, uh, Oh, if it can be fast tracked, you know, as Ireland recovers and you get commercial interests and others involved, maybe it could happen within five years. I mean, I, cer I, I certainly agree. Uh, I'd like to see it happen before I retire. Anyway. <laughs> well, that's it, Coffee time. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, guys.